and a master's in teaching English as a foreign language. He is currently a student at the Doctorado Interinstitucional en Educación at the Universidad Distrital Francisco José de Calda with a major in ELT. He has taught English at elementary, high, and high school and university level for 12 years. His research interests focus on teachers' social practices, subject positioning, professional development, and class practices. Let me introduce you. His mentor is Dr. Pilar Mendez Rivera. He is a doctor in education from Universidad Santo Tomás. He is a master in Spanish linguistics from Instituto Caro y Cuervo. He holds a bachelor's degree in modern languages from Universidad del Atlántico, Colombia. He is currently a tenured lecturer, lecturer at the Universidad Distrital Francisco José de Caldas at the Doctorado Interinstitucional en Educación and the Licenciatura Program in English. Her research lines are in subject constitution, resistance practices, decoloniality, and teacher education. Our international uh, guest, Dr. Clarissa Menendez Jordao. She holds a PhD in literary education at USP. She has developed research with the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia, and with the University of Manitoba, Canada. She currently teaches EFL at undergraduate level, bachelor and teaching degree and apply linguistic at graduate level at USTR Brazil. Her main research interests are in the areas of teacher education, critical literacy in EFL, and post-structuralist theories on language and meaning making. Our national evaluator, Dr. Jairo Eduardo Soto Molina from Universidad del Atlantico, holds a PhD in Human Sciences uh, from the University of Zulia, Maracaibo, Venezuela. He has a Master in Education from Universidad de Antioquia, Medellín. He studies social research at Newbury College, Massachusetts, USA, and uh, has a postdoc diploma in epistemological paradigms of qualitative, quantitative and qualitative research at Instituto de Estudios Avanzados. He started teaching English to children at, at the University of California, San Diego, and his um, research lines are in interculturality, curriculum, and teacher education. And uh, last but not least, our in, uh, examiner, faculty examiner from the program, Dr. Castañeda Peña. Uh, Harold Castañeda has a PhD in education from Goldsmiths University of London. He is a lecturer at the Doctoral Interinstitucional en Educación at Universidad Distrital Francisco José de Calda. His research interests are identity, information literacy, and the use of video gaming in teaching English. He is a member of the Intertexto Research Group. Okay, so Miguel, with this, I am giving you the floor. Remember that you have 40 minutes to give your presentation. When you have 10 minutes left, I'm sorry, five minutes left, I will play a very nice and so soothing music so you know that it, you have these five minutes to wrap up. So congratulations on this very special day, Miguel, and good luck. Thank you, teacher uh, Carmen Elena. Uh, could you please confirm if you are listening to me? And now, yes. yeah, and now if you can see the screen, please. Hold on. Yes, uh, can, you, can, can you see the screen? I'm sorry. Yes, Miguelito. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So time is running now. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And uh, thank you for the virtual online audience. Uh, technical problems, uh, of course, happened. But yeah, the idea is to start this presentation um, with a very uh, 
nice emotional aspect. Thank you for the jurors uh, of this thesis. Thank you, uh, teacher Professor Jairo Soto. Thank you, dear teacher Haru Castañeda. And of course, thank you, uh, Professor Clarissa Meneses for being part in this process. Thank you especially to my uh, advisor, Pilar Mendez, Dr. Pilar, it was a pleasure to be next to you. And of course, thank you to my family to be here, my friends, people there. So let's start. The title of this thesis is Resignifying the Subject Positions of Observers, Narrated Experiences of ELT Class Observers in Colombia. This thesis defense is to obtain the degree of Doctor in Education from Doctorado Interinstitucional en Educación a un, an Universidad Distrital, the ELT in Education Major. So let's start. This is the thesis defense program. And I, well, I would like you see um, the eight aspects that I'm gonna get in these 39 minutes. And I'm gonna start one by one. The first one is about myself, who I am. Well, I'm a daddy of a beautiful daughter. She's Luciana. She's the lights of my life. And also I have been working as a public school teacher, private teacher in the schools, and lastly in universities. But also, I have been studying for more than five years at a very great university here at my home, at Universidad Distrita. But before starting with this um, thesis, I would like to express my opinion about the title. What is the title? It's about observers, and not only observers, but the observations. What is observation? What is it? So the following short video is about observation and some friends have recorded this video in order to introduce the topic of this thesis, in order to introduce the observation. So this is the video. Please uh, let me know, uh, teacher uh, Carmen Elena, please, if you can see the video and also if you can hear uh, the video. Give me a second, please. Yes. And share. Here? Yes. How long, please? Not yet, right? No problem. Okay. Okay. Observation for me is that. Yes. Hello, Miguel. I think observation for me is to pay close attention carefully. Uh, it's a kind of a connection that we establish or a relation with the person or the situation that we are observing. So I don't think we can separate who we are to the things we see, to the things we understand. And I don't think we do that just by looking at the situation or at the person. We use all of our senses. An observation is a collaborative process in which a teacher is guided and supported by a group of fellow colleagues. Observation for me is the action of going beyond of what we can see and perceive around us, to go beyond our reality. It's a power of analyzing things. La observación para mí es el análisis de un fenómeno. En este caso, con las cámaras, me puede servir para estar apreciando lo que hacen los estudiantes, los observo y analizo en qué fenómeno pueden incurrir. Observation is paying close attention to details, to analyze, to understand and reflect. Y la observación es lo que uno mira a los alrededores y lo que tiene uno como la, las cámaras acá todos, todos tenemos visualizado lo que es lo del colegio, las áreas de afuera, es lo que visualiza uno diario. For me, observation it's the process of closely and intentionally watching or monitoring something, um, often to gain information, insights, or better understanding about a phenomenon or a situation. Observing has meant 
detailing, unveiling, comprehending, deconstructing, transforming, inquiring, learning, just to mention some actions that are key to growth. Um, but observing has also meant for me dealing with intentions geared towards judging, imposing, controlling, demanding, or harming. Into the next step of the presentation. Could you please, teacher um, Carmen Elena, to let me know if you can see the presentation? No, I think not yet. Not yet. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yes. Yes. So, my friends, we're talking about observation, but how about myself in the observation system? I used to work in universities when I started working in the observation practices, and I observed some pre-service teachers, but also I was observed by my, by my teachers. But at the same time, I started working with a well-recognized institution here in Colombia called British Council with a program called Bilingualism National Program, which is a program that interacts with many um, you know, teachers, students, and not also teachers and students, but observers. I got training to be an observer. I received uh, some guidelines, rubrics, special training to be let's say, an observer inside, and not only inside, but outside classes. And also, I started working as an observer, as an ELT observer in different settings, places here in Bogota, here in Colombia. It was my beginning about observation, but also I identified on the second part of this thesis some problem statements. And this is an iceberg, and it is the part that we can see on the iceberg. What we can see during the observations? Well, that the observation is for recollecting information and evaluating process. Also, the observation is to understand and to improve teaching. But there is a grand narrative about the observer. The observer is an expert with high profile, with a high uh, credential, high credentials. And the observer also should provide feedback. Feedback is also a powerful word here in the observation practices. But the observer handles rubrics not only to evaluate, but judging, judging the process. These aspects for me in the problem statement is called a normalization of the observer subject positions as a canonical practice in the ELT field. Why is a canonical practice? It's something regular, it's something normalized. But perhaps there are some aspects that we don't see in the observation practices. This is the underneath part of the iceberg. Some aspects that we don't see in the observation. Misunderstanding of the observer's emotions, the feelings of the observers. When I was working with Ministerio de Educación, MEN, Secretaría de Educación, sometimes it was not possible to express my opinions, my feelings. And also, there is a believing about the observer as a machine, but not only as a machine, ignoring the observer's subject positions, the positions of the observers. Those aspects are called dehumanization of the observers, subjectivities in the classroom observations. Why dehumanization? Ignoring, misunderstanding, among other aspects. Also, there is a regulation of the authority while observing the top-down system. Most of the cases, the observer feels, you know, in a, in a high supreme aspect. But also, there are some struggles when we are assessing, when we are observing. What are struggles? Maybe when we are handling rubrics, the guidelines, the format, but also negotiations in the observer subject positions. Negotiations, not only with the observed teacher, but between observers, myself, okay? There are some uh, introspective negotiations. These aspects are called inv invisibility issues of power in the observer subject positions. These were the problems of this thesis. 
So here we have the full iceberg, and in the full iceberg we have the problem question, you know, the question of this research. What is, what other observer subject positions have been neglected by the canonical way to observe in the ELT field? And the objectives. Here we have the objectives. Uh, I'm not going to read all of them because later we're going to cover all of them. So after the research objectives and the question, I started tracing back on literature about observation. And not only observation, but the observer, the subject observer. In many parts of the world, in the East, in West, North America, many people, many scholars have researched about observation. But here in South America, also, we have explored about the topic, about observation in Brazil, in Chile, in Uruguay. And I explore more than 140 research articles related to class observation and the observer position, including different databases such as Scopus, Eric, Web of Science, among other ones. And I identify that the observation is not only in the educational field, but maybe in other fields such as social sciences, psychology, human, among other fields. So I started working with clusters. So what are clusters? They are like, uh, you know, a similar words in the same map. What is the same map? Observation. And I started identifying some, some key words. For example, in observation, the peer observation is very important. Also, the feedback quality, management. And here in the profiling with more than 140 articles, I identify that the impact program among other areas are relevant in this thesis. When I identify the clusters and co-occurrences, I started working with the antecedents of this research. For me, the roots of the research. And I dig into three tendencies. The first one, the first tendency, let's say the gap that I recognize in the thesis. The first one, the prescriptive role of observers within systematic processing of evaluation. Observation for evaluating. Observation to follow a systematic structural, um, let's say pattern. The second tendency I identify, the supremacy of the observer subject position as an instrument to control and provide effectiveness. In this specific part, the observation plays a relevant role, let's say, in the neoliberalism aspects, okay? The effectiveness, powerful, let's uh, organize the ideas about the pattern. And the last, but not the least, in the tendency is the bilingualism national program affects the role or the, or the position of the observer and also the teacher's performance. Here in Colombia, there is a plan, there is a biling bilingualism national program plan, and Ministerio de Educación, Secretaría de Educación are hiring, they are hiring observers to observe, to control, to supervise, to evaluate the English language teachers' uh, performances. But this thesis also offers a wide panorama that is not only related evaluation or performance. So how about the concepts, or let's explore the basis and foundations in this thesis. First of all, about observation. And in Foucault's uh, words, observation is worked as a social dynamic. This is the panopticism in uh, Foucault, uh, actually is taken from Bentham some time ago. And the observation, for me, is a disciplinary technology. Why a disciplinary technology? because the observation is to carry out tasks, also to perform ceremonies and to emit signs. But the observation is also in education. I said it before, but not only in the ELT field, in different areas, for example, mathematics, science, different. And it is from prescription to descriptions, from prescript prescriptive until descriptive. And in the ELT field, Classroom observation as an operative device of learning English. This is very important about the basis and foundations in this thesis. Social dynamic, education, and ELT field, but only the observation. If we have the observation, of course, we need to have the observer, the subject positions of the observers. Haren mentions 
the positions of the observers are dynamic. They are not static. We are not in the same line. The observer is changing permanently. The subject position, the subject with knowledge from Ramon Grossfogel, the subject with knowledge is an abstract one without appearance, but this subject has a clear individualistic and universal vocation. And the subject observer. Bruns et al. said, the observer also uses different aspects that help the individual teacher's abilities. What aspects? Of course, the instruments, rubrics, techniques, guidelines. Those aspects are permeated into the position of the observer. When I finish um, the basis, the foundations, I started talking about the methodological design that I called doings, means, and ways in the ELT observer's positions. And I went into three main components into this um, process. The first one is that the, ontol the ontology is before the epistemology. Basilachis mentioned that time ago, but uh, for me in this thesis, the knowledge is relevant, the knowledge is important. But how about the feelings, desires, positions? The ontology is also relevant. Second, participants as teammates. I would like to introduce very briefly uh, the team, the team of this thesis. Well, we have been working, we were working, uh, four of us, and the first person is Tania. She's a very passionate uh, educator. She's a fan of arts. And she was also part of the observers in Secretaría de Educación at the British Council. Also Wilson. Wilson has a beautiful dog called Pepita, okay? And he's a very nice friend. But he also had experience uh, international in, in international settings and locally. Alex, we have been uh, friends with Alex for so much time. And he has been part of the bilingualism national pro program. And Miguel here that I hope to continue sharing with this team, okay? This is not the end, okay? We are constructing. And also my classes, which is something very particular, my classes were observed by an ELT observer when I was in, the, in a public school and it was fantastic. It was beautiful because this is a mirror effect, right? Um, I'm a teacher, I'm a student, I'm also an observer and I have multifaceted uh, positions. So why the team? We were working together. We were having training together and we were uh, having conversations which are not expressed in the bilingualism national program, which are not, um, which are not said. So after that, the horizontal provocation. What is this horizontal provocation? What was that in the, in the thesis? Well, it was the construction of knowledge created in the intersection by subjects. When I decided to run into this research, I created some autobiographical uh, narratives with, uh, of course, the help of my advisor. We were starting creating autobiographical texts and those texts were given to the team, to, the, to my team. And I think this, um, let's say, mutual aspect of interaction represents for me a horizontal aspect. So these three aspects were playing into the methodological design. Well, it is a narrative study, um, as, you, as you can see, uh, Barhausen defined a narrative study as a systematic inquiry that focuses on people's stories, observers' stories. This is a qualitative research, biographical and autobiographical texts, life stories, the narrative path was composed by transcriptions, ways, let's say instruments, means, among other ones, and it was a provocative narrative. What was this provocation? It was the narrative, my narrative to the teammates, because as soon as, as they got the papers, they started talking about uh, their experiences and their wishes, their desires, and of course, their voices. So how was the construction path of this huge narrative about observers? Well, I took into account two aspects about narratives. The first one from Jerome Bronner is that one event comes from another event, like a sequence. 
And of course, uh, Biesta mentioned there is a chronological sequence in the narratives. These two aspects were also explored into this chart. I'm not gonna read the chart, but you can see here the number of participants, the teammates, and something very important that I would like to highlight is that during pandemia, we were talking about observation in the, in the teammate, in the team, with the teammates in the team. And uh, there is a total of meetings and the transcriptions. So as soon as, as I finished this construction path, I started, uh, give me a second, please. Yes, I started working with the close look at observers' narratives. And here we have the discoveries about the thesis. In the discoveries, I organize, well, not organize, but I kept in mind two main aspects. The first one is a subjective interpretation of ELT observers' narrative. And the second is a temporal sequence events of the ELT observers. In both of them, the teammates, the ELT observers, were starting uh, writing about their narratives, about observation. And we include some titles. The first one is Skillful and Experienced Class Observer. Wilson mentioned a very important aspect of the Foreigner Expert as an observer. And he says, more uh, it's clear that all that over 90% of more is made up of local talent. Observers have a strong developmental training component for doing a great job. Okay, a skillful, experienced class observer. But Tania mentioned the following. When I met the teacher, she was going through an anxiety crisis due to a light situation in the observation. She knew her class was not going to be possible as she had planned it. It was a situation in which neither she nor I could do anything. It was out of our hands. I felt frustrated, but I was conscious punishment was not going to contribute to her growth as a teacher. Humbleness, when we are observing classes. And also, Alex mentioned something very important on the learning observer. I first learned this in so-called apprenticeship of observation, basically by seeing other people do it. Then I learned a lot of by reading, teacher uh, training books, and studying the observation instruments of courses such as SILTA and DELTA. I then studied basic principles of assessment like reliability, credibility, and validity, and then start designing my observation instruments, a learning observer. It was the first part of the, let's say, the analysis. It was a discovery into the huge narrative. And also, in my case, I realized the importance of ref reflecting upon observation practices. And for me, it was very important. They um, require observations and get as much data as possible. The reasoning observer. Those four discoveries, and there are not only four, this is just an example, we're covering, uh, let's say, the objectives of the thesis. Understanding, I started understanding the observer subject positions in the narrated experiences. And also, I started identifying the observer's negotiations among their different subject positions. Because the learning observer is not static. The learning observer, the learning observer is transiting to the reasoning observer. And um, maybe, to the uh, expert observer, among other ones. So when I finish working on the, um, on the discoveries, I started looking at the question, my research question, the thesis question. What observer subject positions have been ignored, neglected by the canonical way to observe in the ELT field? Well, here we have the four you can see this. We can see here the four observers' positions that I identify, explore. The first one, the knower ELT observer. The knower ELT observer. In this training, there is undoubtedly a format to follow. 
during the observation. I have followed it and I agree with it, but you should also talk to the EFL teacher. The work that I have done over the last 10 years must be professional and meaningful. The knower ELT observer has an objective process when carrying out an observation. Objectivity, inside subjectivities. We say like, how come? Yeah, because uh, the observer during the training follows a pattern, a guideline. But unfortunately, sometimes we don't have voices. We don't have the time. We don't have, let's say, the opportunity to express our opinions. The Nowhere ELT observer has expertise in several characteristics of an EFL class. For example, classroom management, lesson planning, material design, etc. The Nowhere ELT observer needs to evaluate the observed aspects, assessing, evaluation, and in every single moment. And also, the Nowhere ELT observer uses the feedback as a powerful tool. Feedback for correcting and feedback for a main strategy in the observation practice. But if we have the Nowhere ELT observer during these insights, uh, contributions, we have the contextualized ELT observer. Who is the contextualized ELT observer? Well, this is a narrative taken from uh, Tania, and it says, the third event uh, happening to me some years ago when I was offered to work with a renamed international language teaching institution along with the Secretary of Education for implementing English language policy in public schools in Bogota. I felt this would be the chance to have a role in policies, which is something I so far from reaching in my role as a university teacher. The contextualized ELT observer implements mainstream observation techniques tools in the context of the EFL classes but also the contextualized EFL observer provides valuable information to policymakers, education programs, bilingualism projects, among other ones. Also, the contextualized ELT observer identifies diverse effective ways to transform educational system for the benefit of class observers, teachers, and the whole community, the students, of course. And the contextualized ELT observers gives support to the local and national entities and the government schools or educational institutions. The contextualized ELT observer is the one who knows the context and not only the context, but territories and not only the territories, but our realities in the, in the ELT field. But also we have the emotional ELT observer. This is another contribution to the, let's say, to the, to the field uh, in this thesis. During the observation sessions, I'm feeling mad or arrogant. My understanding of the class and the observed teacher is going to be impacted by those feelings. I remember I felt like an outsider and rejected by some of public schools where I observed in service language teachers. I could feel how aware it was for, uh, for the observed teacher to have me in their classroom just because they might have been forced to do it. Those feelings I got position myself emotionally towards uh, the observation moments I experienced. So when I was receiving, got in, uh, getting training um, in different institutions, uh, the feelings are not relevant. The feelings are not uh, a very important aspect in the, in the observation practices. For that reason, the emotional ELT observers is a person who gets, who has highly sensitive feels and the need to be understood, tends to avoid conflict, is thoughtful, empathetic, and intuitive uh, during class observations, is respectful and polite. He or she is very sensitive to criticism and reacts passionately. And also the emotional ELT observer does not pay too much attention on the rubric, on the guidelines. You know, the rubrics or guidelines are in the, you know, in, 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 the, in the another table. I mean, they're not important. Why? Because the emotional ELT observers, we are listening to the observed teachers. We are being in their shoes in a very ethical position. And also, we understand the realities of classroom environment. It's about the emotional ELT observer. 
And the last, but not the least, is the fellow ELP observer. I feel more like a colleague observing and learning from others. I try to display a sense of learning and understanding without showing judgment uh, perspectives. Even if there is a set of objectives to be accomplished, the main idea is to construct building with the fellow colleague who is being observed. This is an excerpt uh, from Alex's narrative um, in where I would like to mention that it was not easy to work with uh, some, uh, some people during the observation because uh, the observed teacher uh, reacts negatively, you know, to the observer. But we, as ELT observers, the fellow ELT observer position helps us to realize the importance to get on well with the teacher, to be, uh, I mean, in their shoes, and also to understand the fellow, the fellow colleague. This fellow ELT teacher interacts and discusses with the observed teacher. There is a space of dialogue, conversation and reflection. And unfortunately, when we are getting training for being observers, we don't have time for this time, for conversations, for dialogues. Also, the fellow ELT observer not only examines the dynamics of an observation, not only the classroom management, the lesson planning, the use of materials, didactics, no. This observer understands the social tasks that the observer teacher fulfills and comprehends in through, through observation. And lastly, recognizes the responsibility involved in teaching English and reaches, uh, reaches agreements with the observed teachers to benefit the educational community. This fellow ELT observer listens, interprets, and provides options or benefits to the community or in the ELT field. The four here we have, yes, here we have, yes, here we have the relevance and discussion in the ELT observer positions, the knower ELT observer, contextualize, the emotional and the fellow. But how about the contribution of knowledge in this thesis during, during the studies? Well, um, I divided into three parts. Reflections on the ELT observer's positions. As I said before, the observers sometimes uh, don't have voices. Uh, we don't express our opinions, and those opinions are not on the data, on the bilingualism national programs, on the system. And probably during this um, thesis, there is like a more humanizing classroom observation practices. Also, uh, the resignification of the observer trajects beyond his or her practice unconventional way to build up facts, horizontality, mutuality, horizontality when researching. I, I felt very nice to work with my teammates in this team because I have learned a lot. And the team is uh, not only the group of observers, but for example, with my teachers here at Doctorado, also with my friends, with my classmates during these five years and a half, it was great to work in this horizontality. Also, the substantial narratives. Narratives not only as excerpts, but uh, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't say that, but uh, it was too much material, too many documents, texts, stories, anecdotes, uh, experiences, uh, story lives. It was, it was beautiful to analyze each step into the observer, not only the observer, but the positions, and not only the positions, but the observation practices. And there were, in, in this thesis, some unseen issues in life stories. What unseen issues? For example, problems that observers have had during their practices. Um, sometimes I don't feel comfortable to observe a teacher, but this narrative is not in the, in the data. This narrative is not in the bilingualism pro uh, program or plan. And maybe the next step in this thesis is to keep doing, uh, you know, working in the, uh, in the observation, but not about the observers. Why not the observed teachers, the person who is next to us in the observation? Because I focus mainly on the observers. But how about the observed teachers? How about the students who observe us, you know, in the classroom? And not only in the classroom, outside. 
detailing and reflecting on class observations at an interdisciplinary level. What is an interdisciplinary level? Where, well, mathematics class, science classes, uh, physical education, social studies classes, because the observation is not only in the ELT field, but in different areas, in different uh, fields. For example, here in Colombia, uh, public school sector, schools, they need to record themselves. They need to be observed by a machine to, to, to guarantee the quality of uh, performance, you know, to have another level in the, in the, in the payment, you know. And there is, uh, the, the, there, there is a camera observing their classes. How about not to start in, you know, uh, researching about it? And finally, the observations in Colombian settings, not only in Colombian settings, but international. How about observations in different countries? How about observation in different territories here in Colombia? Yeah, it's different to observe a class here in Bogota than another place, yeah, because of the context, because of the culture, uh, cultural settings, and also because of different events. What is the closure or the closing remarks in this thesis? Well, the first one, uh, I allow myself to read it. Observers play a de decisive, a decisive, sorry, decisive role in education. Our subjectivities appear to be mistreated by the system, local regulations, external education institutions, and the instruments we use during their work. The rubrics, guidelines, instruments of observations are part of a colonial system. As I have said, uh, this is a very colonial uh, practice. But what is the idea? These colonial mechanisms that are reflected in some ELT ideologies and practices, which are the control, supervision, and invisibilization of opinions, were caught in these observers' narratives. And finally, it cannot be denied that the knowledge produced on classroom observation includes methods, guidelines, rubrics, and procedures that have been shown to be effective in the effectiveness of classes. However, I interpret that observers resist the practices of observation since we perform it as a way of restoration and reparations that depends on the context, historical conditions, and cultural aspects. This is the end of uh, the presentation, uh, the dedication. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, for your very presentation. Um, and congratulations on the excellent management of time. Um, well, now uh, we are after listening to Miguel. Each one of the examiners will have 10 minutes to offer questions, or comments, or suggestions. And after that, uh, Miguel will have 30 minutes to provide answers. So I would like to invite our international uh, guest, Dr. Clarissa, to uh, start with the question. Uh, Clarissa, would you like me to let you know when your time's up? Um, it's just 10 minutes, right? It's 10 minutes, yes. Yeah, so I it, it, it's okay if you like to two minutes before, but I don't. I don't think I'm even going to use the full ten minutes. Okay, so <laughs> let's the see. Floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me here. It's a huge pleasure to be at Universidad Distrital once more. Uh, my only wish at the moment is to be there with you in person one day, because so so far I've been at university, but only online. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, dear Miguel, you already know this, but I just can't stop myself from mentioning it officially. Um, your research has opened up a huge universe to me. I've learned so much reading it, um, you know, from the project to the full thesis more recently. So 
I, you know, I can't thank you enough for that. Very, thank you very, very much indeed. And of course, thank you, Pilar, for expanding my contact with the uh, Colombian uh, TEFL, especially, and for um, widening its scope in the contact with other colleagues from Universidad Distrital and ASOCOPI. So um, in the little time I have, I, I, I've thought of stressing or pointing out two um, of the, what I feel are the main qualities of, um, of Miguel's uh, thesis and research, and then two questions that are still lingering in my head. After, of course, I dedicated a lot of effort to come up with these two questions because, you know, the whole process, in the whole process, there was a lot of revision and a lot of uh, conversation between uh, Miguel and myself on, uh, on his um, research. So to me, for me, the first um, strength of, uh, of your work, uh, of Miguel's work is his courage. And perhaps, we could, and we could say that of Pilar as well as his supervisor to challenge some academic conventions and break up with this rigid discourse that demands emotions to be out of the picture. Um, as, as we could see in the presentation today, Miguel's text is pretty much, um, perhaps I could stereotypify it as Latino uh, in the sense that it lets his effect towards his profession, towards his teammates, and also towards his research come up to the foreground. Um, and he does so both by making them visible at different moments of, of, his, um, of his text, and uh, also by using different forms of notation, uh, forms of printed representation or, and images that are unconventional in our colonial academic discourse. It's, um, I'm referring here to what um, Miguel just pointed out as the unconventional ways to build up facts, um, horizontally, horizontality and mutuality. Um, so congratulations on that. I think this is really you know, uh, important and perhaps groundbreaking for academic discourse. Um, and the second, the second strength then comes with, I think, Miguel's awareness of his own implication as a researcher on his research and also his explicit thematization of his presence as an interpreter in the interpretation. So he's not only an observer, but he's also an interpreter producing knowledge, producing interpretations um, with the narratives that he offers his readers. So, um, in other words, I think that um, this second strength has to do with how Miguel has explored the silences, the invisibilities, both in academic writing uh, but all, uh, and knowledge building, and also in teacher observation, which is his, uh, his main focus. So congratulations again here, uh, Miguel, on making that explicit, on problematizing this dichotomy between subjectivity and objectivity, which I consider to be your main decolonial move in, in your research. I love that. Um, okay, so, um, okay, as Shakespeare would put it then, without much ado, <laughs> let's go to the two questions I'd like to put to, uh, to you, Miguel, in face of the last version of, the, of your thesis. Um, I understand that I'm expected to ask some questions here. So I made an effort instead of just, you know, pointing out strengths, um, I made this effort to still come up with questions after um, your last very detailed and careful revision of the text. It wasn't easy <laughs> for me to come up with these questions, but I did, I did come up with two. So the first one then, Miguel, um, it has to do with this tension that I feel you seem to have been struggling since your project was uh, was 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 being written. Um, it's, it's this tension between objectivity and subjectivity in the observation process. This what I mentioned before, you know, as a strength. Um, 
I sense such tension in or is pr also present in your writing, not only in your research, not only in the observation process, but also in the way you write, in your choice for words. As for example, when you refer to narratives being real or imaginary, uh, when you refer to research findings, which um, um, you replaced, it's a word that you replaced by discoveries after I made some comments in the last written report, but I'm still not sure this change from findings to discovery um, still, or discoveries still makes much difference because discoveries is a word that still uh, that's still contained in this lexical field of uncovering something and therefore of finding out something that has been purportedly hidden. And I feel a word such as perhaps interpretation or impression would be more appropriate to your perspective on research. Though I know that many people would consider it less scientific. So I'm, I'm being confused here um, and confusing. Uh, so my questions, my, my questions here are two, in fact, in, 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 in this regard. First question is, have you resolved this tension between objectivity and subjectivity in academic research, you think? Do you think you have also resolved it for yourself in the observation process, in the way you look into the observation process right now? And the second part of the question is, if you feel that there is one dimension of these two, objectivity or subjectivity, um, that is more salient, more important, more significant in the process of class observation. So I just wanted, if you have time, and if you don't have time today, um, I know where you live. So um, I will be trying to, to learn a little bit more, to use up your time a little bit uh, to find out um, about this if you don't have time to answer today. And in the second group then of questions, um, it's, it's about what I asked you in the last um, review, in the last written comments I sent you. I also asked you to expand your, your analysis of the narratives and to explicitly relate them to your decolonial theoretical background. Um, I also asked you to stress in which moments uh, the observer's um, constitutive coloniality came to the fore and which decolonial moves uh, you feel that your observers have produced according to your interpretation of their narratives. So in your response, you did mention some examples of moments in the text, but I'm still not much convinced. Um, they were not clearly decolon decolonial to me. So I'd like to hear you if you can, or if you care <laughs> about how you connect these moments um, or some parts of your of the narratives um, to specific dimensions of decoloniality that are present in your theoretical background. Um, the examples you mentioned in, in, in your, in your um, response to my comments, um, seem to be more seem to me uh, more telling of a critical perspective than a decolonial one. Um, as for example, when you mentioned the observer's acceptance and welcoming of diverse methods that are used by teachers, or um, they're considering emotions as an important part of teaching and observing. So I'd, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on other instances where you did notice decolonial moves or attitudes in the observer's narratives, um, if you have the chance, and also how you see the differences, if you see any differences between criticality and decoloniality, because I also have this, it, and this is not a rhetorical question um, at all. Uh, you know, I've been struggling with the, um, with these two dimensions of our work, criticality and decoloniality, and how they overlap or they don't overlap. Oh my God, this is it. I think I made it in less than 10 minutes, right, Carmen? So that's it for now. Thank you very, very much. And Miguel and Pilar, congratulations. The thesis is really exciting to read. It's fascinating to learn um, you know, at least 
to me as non-Colombian, um, it was a whole, you know, new world. We don't have this kind of structured observations in Brazil. Um, um, so they, they are, um, they're just contained in language institutes mostly. Um, so it's, it's been really fascinating. And the whole contact with Miguel and with Colombian TEFL has been really exciting to me. Thank you. I can't, I, I, I won't ever be able to thank you enough. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Larissa, for your questions, for your comments, too, for um, Miguel. And now I am inviting Dr. Jairo Soto to offer his comments and questions. I think he's in the room, right? I mean, there in Paiva. Um, and I wonder if we have Dr. Soto. Okay. Tell you when time's up. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, I would like to congratulate first to Miguel on the quality of his presentation. I found it remarkably interesting and thought provoking. And I think that these are the, the research that are going to impact our medium, our educational medium for sure. And it's going to transform the practices and mostly the observation practice that is a bit uh, positivist here in Colombia. Having said that, I am going to read aloud some words that I wrote to comment on some aspects of your work. And at the end, I would, like, I would finish my reading with a question. First, I would like to thank Dr. Pilar Mendez for having considered my name for this task. At the same time, I would like to express my gratitude to the Doctorado Interinstitucional en Educación, its director, Dr. Rodolfo Vergel, my colleagues here, Dr. Harold Castañeda Peña, and Dr. Clarissa Meneses and the audience the audience who is attending this section. The research title, Resignifying the Position of Observers in the Research Processes, the Narrated Experiences of Observers of English as a Foreign Language Class in Colombia, addresses the topic of class observation in the context of English teaching as a foreign language ELT in Colombia. This research focuses on observers who play a crucial role in analyzing, judging, criticizing, offering feedback, and providing support to English teachers. This is the first time that I had the opportunity to read about the perspective of four insiders who have worked for the Ministry of Education. Little we know about the voices of English language teacher who occupy this subject position. So my recognition goes to this doctoral program for promoting this critical type of research. Concerning this, the main objective of the research is achieved at a proficient level, making visible the processes of effective invisibility and silencing that occur in class observation practices. It is argued that these practices should not be considered simply as normalized or instrumentalized action, but as part of a social practice in which observers are immersed in a situation of asymmetrical power relations. In doing so, it is interesting how the epistemological reflexivity of Miguel as a main researcher guided us to see that observers are not always totally subjected to this. That despite their duties, they are also English language teachers who understand the challenging of teaching English at a school to children who are not interested in learning the language 
in most of the cases. Miguel's idea suggested that the practice of English uh, uh, class observation, although it is considered an action to improve and support educational processes, has been standardized and is presented unquestionably in the field of English teaching. Furthermore, the role of the observers is rarely examined or judged. Therefore, this research seeks to address these unexplored situations and understand why and how its observation practice is conducted, which is sometimes perceived as a colonial control mechanism and other time as a judgment procedure. In summary, this research seeks to make visible the experiences and subjective position of observers of English as a foreign language class in Colombia, challenging standardized practices and problematizing the power relation present in these practices. This is achieved through a theoretical approach that draws on a decolonial attitude, trying to embrace horizontally. I like the explanation made by my peer evaluator about how colonial systems are employed in this practice. It is requested that the observer must fit into the imaginations, law, and ideologies of the observation practices without paying attention to their opinion, beliefs, and performance. Moreover, I agree with the idea of a disciplinary technology used to control, organize, and amplify the power of the class observation. This seeks to train observers to work for a specific purpose and to be a, pro a productive component in a large multiplicity. This structural way to follow the traditional observations is the aspect that made discipline in the community. And every so often we fortify, ignoring the, the humanization process it entails. When Miguel mentioned that this thesis is located with the observation dynamic that have been conducted in Colombia, South America, he noticed that the four observers have gone through classroom observation training in entities such as the British Council Ministry of Education to consolidate a disciplinary technology. Colombian government has invested a lot of money in this program and is offering success neglects other forms of doing observation. I focus my evaluation on the paradigmatic nature of the study as observation has always been associated with positivism, the observable, the measurable, the quantifiable, the predetermined, and so on. But what I like most was that Miguel approached approach it from the perspective of the social critical paradigm to try to achieve transformation emancipation or liberation of communities in the process of immersion in this research, either as a researcher or a participant. This paradigm doesn't admit predetermined rules of
eh, Teacher Carmen. Eh, eh, no escuché ah. lo, ya terminó el profe Jairo, perdí el audio. Yeah, no problem. Uh, he already finished, but now okay. is uh, okay. Professor Haro. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, are you going to introduce me or? Yes. <laughs> trying to wait until. <laughs> Doctor, I'm sorry. So, um, so now I have our faculty and examiner dissertation. So, thank you. Can I escuchaste or no? Yes, that you are giving me 10 minutes. I know, yes. <laughs> So I'm going to start, right? Right. right. Okay. So um, thank you so much to Clarissa and Carmen Elena for all the gossiping about dancing and waking up early. That was very entertaining and helped us to, you know, overcome all this silently time, you know, while the tech issue was solved. So thank you so much for that. And, uh, well, yeah, sorry, I'm going to get serious. Um, and, you know, just to break with the mold as well, I want to thank, uh, I don't know if they are present here in the auditorium, but I want to thank the team members. I want to thank Wilson for helping us understanding ideas about the syndrome of the foreigner. I want to thank Tanya for reminding us that it is very important to cry as a way of resistance. And I want to thank Alex's ideas for reminding us that we are constantly learning and relearning. Thank you so much to them. And thank you so much to Miguel. This is really, really a happy day. Um, as Carmen Elena said at the beginning, I want to thank Dr. Clarissa Meneses Jordao from the Federal University of Paraná and Dr. Jairo Eduardo Soto Molina from the Universidad del Atlántico for your thoughtful uh, consideration and evaluation of this dissertation. And also to my colleague, Dr. Pilar Mendes for um, challenging the program and challenging Miguel to research this. I remember very clearly at the end of the last BVELT in 2016, organized by the British Council, that I consider it very, you know, irre irreverent that a plenary on gender and English language teaching <clears throat> would be accepted. At that moment, I finished my plenary and people, you know, came close to me to ask me questions. That's all surprised me a lot because my research is improper. Suddenly, a young man approached me to ask me questions, but not about my presentation topic. He was asking me questions about what he should do to get into the Doctorado Interinstitucional en Educación at the Distrital. How did you dare to do that? <laughs> After talking for a while, explaining the requirements and learning about his academic background, we walk away. I thought, I hope he doesn't apply because he needs more to get into the doctorate program. And the enrollment on that first cohort arrived and this young man did not enroll. Two years later, I discovered him on the pre-enrollment list with this crazy idea of studying English class observers, an activity he was doing for the British Council as a consultant. To do this, he had prepared himself academically and professionally. He had read a lot. Then I realized that having that talk in 2016 
at the BBLT was a blessing. At this point, Miguel Martinez has a lot to say about a study that reflects a social struggle within an apparatus of domination. And it takes a lot of work to do it from within. Miguel Martinez became a stranger within, as it could be interpreted from a black feminist decolonial stance, which is not his stance, but I just wanted to mention that, okay? This takes a lot of courage. When I saw him and his name on the list of enrollees, I began to learn from him. And after, you know, helping him and being his teacher also during this doctoral education, I began to learn from him that we pick up ourselves from personal struggles, that there is resilience. And that while we cannot allow any teacher to determine our future, we can understand their feedback with humility and love. That is what I have learned from Miguel Martinez in these years in which I have been able to watch his journey from the shadows with great admiration and respect for his persona and for his constant struggle to open his path in the ELT world in Colombia and some other places familiar to us like Brazil. What a great joy invades me today as I witness his doctoral thesis defense, which I will refer to in a moment. I have more minutes. Miguel's research work has been an excellent pretext for many of us to unlearn that normalized vision we had about classroom observation. Classroom observation, as it is now, is not a praxis, but a robotic practice. For many years of history, this practice has dehumanized not only the one who observes, but also the one who is observed. And that is my first question for Miguel, that you partially answer already. What does it mean to dehumanize in your research? And what does this dehumanization make you feel? In connection to this, who is a subject from a decolonial perspective, as opposed to what you had called disciplinary technology? Miguel's research focuses on the fact that it is necessary to relearn that knowledge is carried within the bodies of those entrusted to observe other colleagues. There is then a colonial situation in ELT, which has been overlooked. And Miguel reminds us of it with great accuracy and enthusiasm. Due to the identification of this colonial situation, Miguel impregnates us with a feeling that revisits the observation of English teachers' classes. He impregnates us with a sense that opens other perspectives, that feeling of being willing to do things differently. One thing that deserves to be done differently is decolonizing one's mind. This is why Miguel is also part of the research process, changing this given idea of the neutral researcher. Decolonizing one's mind is undoubtedly a challenge. This is regardless of the pressure to behave in a specific way as a classroom observer. As conclusion, Miguel Martinez's study is improper and might not be accepted kindly because it does not conform to the core values of traditional ELT research. Neither for the chosen topic nor for the methodological route, which might not be a methodology for some, but attempts to pedagogizar ELT research. How daring to do that? How bold is it not to choose a qualitative method that describes emotions, feelings, contradictions, or affirmations in a phenomenological way? 
when reading the specialized literature about classroom observation, it is essential to notice the dominance of quantitative studies that measure teaching performance against rubrics of effective practice or best practices. And this is my second question for Miguel. Based on the tendencies that you found in the literature, did you get any ideas also about evaluación formativa? If so, could this be connected to your research study? <clears throat> I found Martinez's idea of disclosing his own experiences and struggles, his lived experiences, to the team members to prompt their reflections. And then this is my third question for you. How can your readers trust that such a heterarchical relationship is authentic, genuine, and honest, or horizontal provocation? Would you say to those who think that the researcher has to be objective, sorry, what would you say to those who think that the researcher has to be objective and that the way you presented your research is by no means decolonial, but just narrative? Finally, how would you defend the critique that your research did not solely end up in a taxonomy of observers? and why discoveries rather than knowledge co-construction. Thank you, Miguel Martinez, for your Luciana and your soulmate. We learn a lot about them without observing them. So there is a lot to learn about listening in terms of observing. Thank you for your idea about cross-cultural research and research across contexts to understand this much better. Thank you, Miguel, and congratulations. Carmen Elena, I'm done. Yes, I noticed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Words for you. Miguelito, now you have 30 minutes to answer the questions the exam. So again, you know when you have to be clear. Is that okay? Give me a second, teacher, please, because I can see I can see the screen. Oh yes, got it. Uh, hold on. Okay, yes. Okay. Um, I think I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get the 30 minutes, but maybe uh you will Yes. So uh <laughs> can you hear me, teacher Carmen, Clarissa and the audience and the online audience? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, um, well, um, it was it was a very let's say challenging and at the same time demanding, but mainly uh, emotional moment that I that I had uh, not only in this uh, presentation but during these five years and a half and. Um, I really, I really appreciate the comments, thoughts, and of course contributions to, to the jurors, uh, Professor Clarissa, Professor Jairo, Professor Harold. It was a pleasure to, to be next to you, to, to learn next to you. And we didn't decide to do that, but fortunately you were in my path you were in this uh, in this process because you are the ones and for analyzing your uh, information i would like to thank especially uh, 
Professor Pilar for this uh, help, for, of course, your time and your persona, because um, if it was with you, it was with the only one. So now about uh, the comments, uh, let me start with uh, Professor Clarissa, who helped me not only um, in this uh, PhD uh, process, educational process, but during all other instances. Um, you, are, you, you are such a great uh, scholar, but more than a scholar, you are, you are a kind person who has helped me a lot in the research, but not only in the research, but uh, also in my work and also in my personal life. Many, many thanks, uh, Professor Clarissa, because uh, you were next to me and I felt you were an international advisor who has been talking to me, who has uh, listening to my, to my doubts, to my concerns, and of course, to my comments. Okay, once again, many thanks. And you know, uh, I really appreciate your company and everything that you are. Uh, Professor Clarissa mentioned uh, something important related to the objectivity uh, towards subjectivity. And to summarize uh, her comment or question related to ob objectivity and subjectivity, I would like to, dis uh, to, to introduce myself uh, at the very beginning when I observed, when I started observing classes. And I was a very objective observer. Uh, why? Since we were uh, handling materials, rubrics, guidelines, and forms into the observation, and those rubrics helped me to identify objective aspects. However, when I started the practice in front of uh, a public school or in front of teachers, next to teachers, I realized this is not just the format. The, that is not just the rubric. You, we need to go beyond. And I started hearing, listening to the observed teachers, the EFL teachers, and I started, let's say, building up an emotional time with them. And in that specific time, I realized the observation is not as an objective process, but a subjective one. But more importantly, um, I started resisting to the methods, these colonial methods of rubrics, these colonial methods of including uh, preliminary aspects. And when I realized uh, we need to go beyond these aspects, I started confronting the idea of objectivity instead of subjectivity. This is the first. Um, the first situation I would like to mention about Clarissa's um, thought, talk. And the second is, uh, yeah, is uh, perspective, if it is criticality, if it is the coloniality, if it is positivistic, uh, I'm going to be so open, you know, and honest about my thoughts during these five years, six years, and not only the five years, six years, but during my whole time in the academic process, I would like to say this thesis uh, is getting from many perspectives. When I said many, is, it is a critical position because I wish I could handle uh, a social transformation not only in the observation practices, but in the, in the observation, uh, in the class observation positions, in the, observa in the observer's positions. This is the first aspect about social transformation that involves a criticality. And how about the coloniality? Well, I got uh, struggles, too many struggles, uh, especially when I started the uh, methodology and, you know, the concepts, the theory. And I decided to move on this lens of the coloniality from myself, from a very ontological position, because I think for me, the desires, the wishes, and of course the perspectives of the persona are more important than only uh, a paradigm or a perspective. Um, 
there are some aspects of criticality and decoloniality in this thesis, especially when the ELT observers are resisting, are listening, and also are living the moments of observations. So I think these two aspects uh, represent uh, pretty much what about uh, Clarissa mentioned, and of course the courage, challenging aspects and representations of horizontality are also human and are also part of this research. Many thanks once again, uh, Professor Clarissa. Professor Jairo Soto, um, when, I, when I talk to my advisor, Pilar Mendez, uh, she talked to me about yourself, about you, about your work, and I started uh, reading your, your documents, your texts, your academic um, um, texts, and I realized uh, that, you, that you also were the one to, to analyze, to reflect upon this thesis. Many, many thanks for being part of this journey because you have a different perspective, not different, but diverse perspectives of observations from your territory. And I really appreciate that, especially the words that you have, that, that you have written. It was amazing. It was beautiful how you identify my thesis into few words because uh, this is too much of respect. And I really admire that from you. And to be honest, I felt uh, like uh, you were doing a summary about my, my thesis, like 250, 60 pages, I don't know, of the thesis, and you were summarizing. And I was very proud of listening to myself. And sometimes I felt you, 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 you know more <laughs> about observation than myself. And it was like, oh my God, it was, it was really nice. Um, so, um, I also like your comments related to training, the British Council, Ministry of Education, and also I identify one is important aspect, which is related to the socio-critical paradigm. You identify that in this thesis. And as soon as, as you identify it, you're starting, you know, complementing your ideas with other spheres, with other situations. It was, uh, it was very challenging, but at the same time, meaningful because the critical aspect, the social aspects are recognizing in the observation. So about your question, uh, which is the criticism of the observation practices here in Colombia, um, I will say, I will say it's not easy to change that, but I think the first step is done, the first one, which is this thesis. And not only the thesis, but uh, the documents or the articles or the, you know, productions which are running about the topic. And not only that, it's because I'm talking to my uh, friends, my observers' friends, and they identify we have voices and we have different perspectives to go on, to carry on, to carry on. Uh, what would you do different, you ask me? Well humanizing the ELT um, observation practices, humanizing um, also try to go beyond the instruments, the rubrics. This is not only about um, uh, going on a practice. Uh, this is an introspective exercise because the observer is also a teacher, is also a student and Sometimes, unfortunately, the observers, some observers um, don't identify that, don't pay attention about that, because as you said, uh, it's an asymmetrical relation. Beautiful words, because it's not just about the top-down system. We need to go beyond. And what I change is, first of all, to humanize the observation practices, and then uh, put on the table different options, diversity on that. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Jairo. Um, Professor Harold Castañeda, it is a surprise. Um, it, it was a surprise, the narrative, the anecdote you mentioned uh, some minutes ago, because 
this event is happening most of the time in my mind. Uh, on the BVLT, uh, the conference, I was petrified at talking to you. <laughs> um, you hear me, you listen to me. And I started thinking about the option to learn next to you. And I think I did it during these five years and a half. Um, you are a super humble and great teacher, professor, friend, and human. You are, you are the one who is listening to your students, who is helping your students. And of course, you are the one who is doing something for our ELT field. Thank you, thank you very much for all your time, all your support, and of course, all your patience, because I know you were very patient with me, you know, uh, because uh, hard times, hard times happened uh, when we were started. Yes. Uh, Professor Harold, mm, your words um, were completely, um, you know, fascinating about uh, the role of the observer and the observer and the observation practices, not only as, as a way, as you mentioned, in the narrative system, in the narrative process, but also in the human, in the human aspect, because uh, this is so powerful, not only in the thesis, but how you recognize and your comments in the document were like, exactly on the on the dot exactly on the on the passages i try to do my best to complete all the comments but i have i have three um situations that i would like to mention and the first one is the question about dehumaniz dehumanizing dehumanization well i i felt dehumanized in one experience uh, especially at the British Council, when they give me a rubric of evaluation and they told me that I needed to continue that guideline, that rubric, to observe a class. And I argue, and I said, like, how about an extra comment, a feedback within the, within the teachers? And two people told me, like, no, Miguel, it's not it was not possible. You need to follow that uh, rubric. And I re-asked and said, why? Because your comments and your data will be only in a document and nobody is going to read that. Immediately at that time, I realized the importance to humanize the observers. And why it was a dehumanization process? Because I was ignored. I was invisible. And people didn't listen to me, didn't hear me. This is the first one. The second one is the, okay, I really like, I really like this one. It's about the evaluation formativa from uh, public uh, school teachers, especially, and not only for public school teachers, but some teachers at university, professors at university, they need to be observed and they need to have a great um, um, grade, you know, to obtain, I don't know, another escalafon, another status. And yes, I, 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 was, I was reading about that and I was researching and it's really demanding. It was a really demanding process because uh, it's true, you have a BD, you have a camera in front of you or a person who is recording your class. And it happens in our system. How about if in the future we can problematize uh, this practice? This is what I would like to do. And maybe it can be the next step because the first step is this, and I need to move on. I need to continue working on that. But of course, this evaluación formativa represents a huge challenge, not only in our field, but in our, all the areas, in the educational Colombian areas. And the third one, uh, well, the third and the, yeah, third one, next one, next one, other one, authentic and genuine. Uh, um, I, I think during this time, during the during six years, five years and a half, I I tried to be different. <laughs> I I tried to be out of the out, out of the shape, uh, and I think it was important because to be authentic, 
um, represents your emotions, and not only your emotions, but your way of seeing the life. And I think this thesis, this research, also helped me to identify different perspectives in education. And I, uh, and I am more than glad to be part of this uh, doctorate program, not only in the ELT field, although in, the, in other uh, seminarios, in other classes. I learned too much and I relearned because something that I think it was, it, it was given for granted, it was not like that. And I really appreciate long time of great, uh, you know, long nights studying and studying, working, you know, reading and reread. It was very, uh, you know, important. I, I know the time was necessary, but during this authentic and genuine, it was about two steps in my research. The first one, horizontality, and more than horizontality, the mutuality. Horizontal, the provocation I did, the provocation I did with the teachers, with my classmates, with, with, with the teammates, this provocation was representing too much. And the second one is listening permanently, you know, the, the teammates. Last but not the least, why discoveries? Why not a co-construction? Well, uh, and also Professor Clarissa mentioned um, in the document uh, findings, Miguel, how about another aspect? I mean, you are moving into the decoloniality or criticality. And I found something to adapt, but to be honest, it's, it's not easy. I'm learning in, the, uh, in this process, not only in criticality, decoloniality, transformations, diversity, and it's not easy, you know, to, uh, how can I say that? To, to marry, to engage, to embrace one of them, and this thesis gets a lot. And it is like a bricolage. I remember one of our classes time ago. It is a bricolage of desires, emotions, and let's say expectations. Because the class observations and this research was something unexpected, was something real, and was something for life. Uh, thank you once again, Professor Pilar and for everybody and the audience online and my my wife thank you yes i think uh, teacher carmen i think that's all thank you very much thanks a lot so, um, I wonder if there are any doctors in the room, either in the virtual room or in the physical room, that might want to add a comment or say something. It is welcome to do it right now. So, if you can help me, the ones that are in Paiva, is there any doctor that wants to say something? Well, I guess I 